of them want to change the world. Others just want to sing about love and heartache. Here come the singer-songwriters. James Blunt owes a little of his incredible success to actress and writer Carrie Fisher, whom he lodged with in L.A. while recording his debut album, Back to Bedlam. Apparently, the Star Wars star suggested the name of the album and let him record the song Goodbye My Lover in her bathroom. Really, Bedlam refers, as you may know, to a mental institute in London, and uh, the songs really for me are a recollection of thoughts and ideas that normally uh, are, are quite private that you'd keep perhaps locked away in the cell of your own mind rather than sharing with, with people. And, and so for me this was a return to those memories and ideas from, uh, from my life experiences and recalling those and documenting them. It ended up being the third single off the album, You're Beautiful, that turned the former soldier into a worldwide sensation. And everyone wanted to know what the song was about. You're Beautiful is just one chapter in, in that um, and it was really about a moment where I saw my ex-girlfriend on the underground with uh, her new man, who I didn't know existed, but she and I caught eyes and lived a lifetime in that second, and I haven't seen her since. Back to Bedlam sold 11 million copies worldwide and went two times platinum in the US, with many of its songs featuring on American TV shows like Grey's Anatomy and The O.C. His ruffled lover looks, fondness for nightclubbing and high-profile romances with the likes of supermodel Petron M. Kova have also generated plenty of media interest in his private life. But James hasn't been phased by the British press's treatment of him. Um, not at all. We just have a tradition for giving each other a hard time in Britain. Um, and I'm sure it's character building. And he certainly hasn't let all the attention go to his head. Um, fame is definitely not, not a measure of success at all, and, and nor is money. Um, fame is a, a human construct, uh, and it's a, a little bit of an addiction of ours, which is not really relevant. We, if we talk about celebrity, we should perhaps focus on people who, who do uh, important jobs like doctors and nurses, a whole host of other um, jobs out there that we could celebrate just as much. He was able to get away from it all to write and record his second album, All the Lost Souls. Uh, I went away to Ibiza, which is a Spanish island, and uh, it was just good to be away from the noise, really, the noise of everyday life and the, the noise of, you know, the media focus and, uh, and the job as a whole and uh, be again on my own and somewhere where you can just really uh, reflect and focus. Following big brother Daniel into the music business definitely gave Natasha Bedingfield a head start when it came to dealing with the rigours of the record industry. You know, he's always a phone call away and I just, um, anytime there's anything that comes up, I just call him and I'm like, hey, how do I deal with this? And I mean, that, that's, that's a great thing about being a younger sister, it happens your whole life. Not that she was riding on his coattails. After growing up singing in Christian pop groups, she landed her own record deal and her first solo release single went straight to number three in the UK charts, paving the way for her debut album, Unwritten, which sold two and a half million copies across the world and earned her a Grammy nomination. She'd gone from being Daniel's little sis to being a star in her own right. You know, everyone has dreams and um, I, I, you know, definitely dreamed and planned for things to happen, but it has happened very fast. In between Unwritten and her second album, NB, her thoughts on being happily single have matured into musings about relationships. That evolution was reflected in her writing on songs like I Wanna Have Your Babies and Soulmate. I want to talk about all the things that you kind of, as a girl, you keep in your head because you know that it's not the appropriate thing to say. And, um, but you're still thinking it. I mean, if you meet a guy that you like, m most girls, when they're talking with their girlfriends later on, they'll, they'll be, you know, thinking of what does his name sound like after mine, or would, would um, our kids inherit his blue eyes? NB ended up being adapted and new songs added to make Pocketful of Sunshine, which became her second album in the US. At the age of 26, after numerous romance rumors, she confessed her songwriting attentions were now fully focused on love. But uh, this album is all about relationships and all about um, the kind of uh, ups and downs that come with that. And um, I really have learned a lot. And actually, I have a boyfriend right now, and it's going really, really well. And um, it's just like you learn so much about yourself through the person that you're with. 
By October 2008, she'd learned enough about herself to know that she wanted to marry Californian businessman and filmmaker Matt Robinson. And I'm just kind of reveling in the excitement of being newly engaged. I've got to keep flashing my ring around all the time. and um, I've never been engaged before and I'll, I'll never be engaged again. You know, this is, I, I'm a big believer in like marriages forever and it's, uh, it's very exciting. By the time John Legend released his debut solo album, Get Lifted, in 2004, he'd already put in some hard yards in the music industry. He was a jobbing session musician for a number of years, playing piano on Lauryn Hill's single Everything Is Everything and Jay-Z's Encore 2, and working closely with friend and hip-hop superstar Kanye West. Kanye dropped by and he was like reminiscing about, you know, what we went through just to get people to know, you know, who I was. And to see it come to fruition, he was just telling me how proud he was of me and, uh, and uh, how happy he was that I was on his label. And I told him, you know, just how appreciative I am of him just helping me get out there to the public. Get Lifted sold over three million copies and spawned the hit singles Used to Love You and Ordinary People. When it went on to earn him a barrow full of Grammy nominations, the soul singer who changed his last name from Stevens wasn't entirely surprised. I knew I was the kind of artist that the Grammys usually like to recognize since I play my own instrument and I write my own songs. Like I have that kind of, kind of credibility that the Grammys usually likes to recognize, but I had no idea that I would get eight nominations and be one of the leading nominees. He ended up taking home three awards and bagged another one with his follow-up album once again. He likes to keep them where he can see them. In my apartment on my piano. So right when you walk in the living room, they're, you know, right there in your face. After basking in the glow of his incredible success, it was down to the business of writing songs for his third album. I'll usually write a song a day. If I'm in the studio and I'm focused on writing, I usually can write a song a day which is uh, pretty productive. <laughs> For 2008's Evolver, he enlisted the help of Kanye West, Andre 3000, Neo and Farrell in an attempt to appeal to new fans as well as pleasing the old ones. Well, every album I make, I'm never thinking, let me see how I can recreate the last album. I'm always thinking, well, what can I do differently? What, what have I listened to over the past few years that's made me, you know, interested, what have, what have I, you know, learned over the past couple of years that uh, make me want to try something else, you know. I'm always looking to do something different. After netting an incredible five Grammy Awards for her debut album, Songs in A Minor, at the age of 20, everyone wondered what more Alicia Keys could possibly have up her sleeve for the release of her second album. Well, I've been busy underground, I like to say. I like to say I locked myself away in a very secret place to really pour my heart and soul out to do this album, The Diary of Alicia Keys. I'm really, really proud of this album. It's like, really showcases how, how much I've grown from the last time you've heard of me. Featuring songs like If I Ain't Got You, You Don't Know My Name and Karma, The Diary of Alicia Keys shot to the top of the Billboard chart in its first week of release and ended up earning the native New Yorker another four Grammys. She then went on to prove that she could do it all live with the release of Unbreakable Alicia Keys Unplugged in 2005, which featured her at the piano playing some of her greatest hits. Uh, it just felt so natural to do this Unplugged album. Um, and it's so much my style, it's what I do. 90% of the year is performing for me, you know what I mean? And, um, and I love it. The album went straight to number one on the Billboard 200 chart and became the biggest selling MTV Unplugged release since Nirvana's 1994 album. Just one year later, at the age of 25, she was back with her third studio album, As I Am. I mean, it's actually way more aggressive probably than my other records. It's, it's um, a, a sense of empowerment for sure that I found in myself and a sense of liberation too that I found in myself and freedom to really express what I feel, exactly how I feel it and no holding back. 
To help her tap into her inner aggression, she called on the services of Uber songwriter producer Linda Perry. It also featured collaborations with John Mayer, John Legend, and UK band Floatry. Once again, she struck pay dirt, bagging another three Grammys, including the 2009 award for best female R&B vocal performance for Superwoman. In the space of just one year, former busker James Morrison rose from the lowly status of complete unknown to becoming the best-selling male solo artist in the UK. Riding on the back of the worldwide success of his debut single, You Give Me Something, his aptly named 2006 album, Undiscovered, went to number one on the British album chart in its first week of release. All the fuss came as rather a shock to the 22-year-old from rugby in Warwickshire, who was tipped to be nominated for a Brit Award. This time last year, uh, I was preparing for um, the start of the gigs that I was going to do. Uh, we did like some gigs in Cardiff, Barfly, and, and some like uni places. And at that time, uh, there was like three people, four people that were watching us. And there was one show in the Cardiff Barfly where there was four people, and three of them were like other members of the other band. And yeah, it was, it was really, it was, it was weird, you know, to go from to go from not really having anyone that's listening there to listen, and then coming here. And, you know, the chance I might be nominated or whatever is, is amazing. When three nominations came, he took a rather relaxed approach to the big night. No, you know what? I, I've come here totally on the kind of, I'm going to enjoy the Brit Awards because it's my first time ever coming to something like this. And, and just enjoy it, you know? You only get one, one chance and, uh, and you may as well enjoy it when it comes along. It went extremely well, with James carrying off the coveted award for Best Male Artist. But winning the awards has never been a big motivator for James, who got to perform his second single, Wonderful World, at the concert for Diana in July 2007. And he lives for playing live. You know, for me, doing gigs on the road and going on the road, spending time with your, with your band and, and just having a good time, and then releasing whatever kind of pent-up energy you've got from being on the bus all day and going on stage and performing in front of... You know, people that want to listen to your music is, is just an amazing feeling. He got stuck into touring Europe after releasing his second album, Songs For You, Truths For Me, which featured collaborations with Jason Mraz and Nelly Furtado. And although he still regularly gets compared to fellow singer-songwriter James Blunt, he's pretty happy with his lot. At the end of the day, singing, singing for a job is always a really good thing, you know, so the other stuff's just like, you just go along with it, you know, don't take yourself too seriously and just in, as long as you're playing good and you're enjoying and you're getting good feedback, then that's, that's, that's all you need, really. Growing up, the daughter of Elvis Presley may have had its pluses. For Lisa Marie Presley, having the king for a father also made the prospect of trying to carve her own niche in the music business horrendously daunting. No wonder it took her until the age of 37 to release her debut album. Just wasn't really ready yet to do it. Um, found just it all happened at the right time. And I needed to put a lot into it. I wasn't going to just do it as like a flash in the pan. So, you know. After signing the deal with Capitol Records in 1998, it took her another five years to finish writing and recording all her own songs on To Whom It May Concern. It went to number five on the Billboard chart and won the respect of her peers. <laughs> Bob Teddy called me out of nowhere one day and was like, saw the video and was saying, uh, just from one artist to another, I think it's amazing and, you know, you have your own thing going on and it's great. Who else? I don't know. A few others. Elton John sent me flowers, um, which I was very happy about. That was very sweet, saying you liked the record. With her first album out of the way, she got down to writing her second Now What, which gave her the opportunity to work some serious stuff out. I think that their theme would be um, me sort of coming to terms with myself, whichever angle I wanted to take, you know, whether it be... Um, angst, anger, sarcasm, attitude, um, or vulnerability. This time she pulled in Linda Perry, Pink, and former Sex Pistols guitarist Steve Jones. However, in interviews to promote Now What came the inevitable questions about coping with comparisons to her father, 
if I hadn't broken through to some degree and found out that I did manage to get fans that actually some of them did or did not know who he was based on my honesty, based on my music, based on whatever it was, my own personality, uh, not something else that was sort of depicted of me. Um, that sort of saved me. Up until 2001, no British R&B artist had made much of an impression on the American charts. 21-year-old Craig David changed all that when his single Fill Me In went to number 15 on the US charts. His debut album, Born To Do It, followed that effort up by peaking at number 11 on the Billboard chart, with his second single, Seven Days, breaking into the top 10. Perhaps his crossover success was not so surprising, considering his music had borrowed a lot from American R&B. It's taken a lot of influences from house music and the US garage music from here, and Chicago-based, and then when it went over to the UK shores, we messed with it a little, took R&B influences, a bit of the house, and then it, it formed this UK garage two-step sound, which I came out of, and it's allowed me to kind of to have a different twist on R&B. Born to Do It made Craig a household name across the globe and sold over 7 million copies. On the eve of the release of Slicker Than Your Average, his good looks and smooth moves had journalists asking whether he might be setting his sights on a film career. I think I'd rather stay focused on one thing, because I think sometimes you put your, your energy into too many different pies, and your fingers into too many different pies, and actually you dilute everything. While Slicker Than Average did nowhere near as swift business as Born To Do It, Craig hit chart-busting form again with his 2005 album The Story Goes. His singles All The Way and Don't Love You No More Sorry both went top 10 in the UK. Craig attributed the renewed success to finding and losing love. It has a lot of songs that really delve into the fact of being in a relationship for eight, nine months, which is not long at all. And most people are like, eight, nine months, it really is not really a relationship, it's just like messing around really. But for me, it felt like a lifetime. Although Craig's 2007 album, Trust Me, failed to trump the success of The Story Goes, in April 2009, he had the pleasure of hearing that Born To Do It had come in at number two on an MTV viewers poll of greatest albums of all time. Pop icon Annie Lennox was named the greatest white soul singer alive by TV music channel VH1. And after being in the limelight for more than a quarter of a century, she's an old hand at dealing with fame. I come out to talk about my work, and, and I'm happy to do that. But it is not my own currency. I'm not famous for being famous. I'm an artist, I'm a musician, I'm a performer, I'm a writer. So I have something to put in front of me and say, this is, this is what I do, this is what I create. It isn't about my face, the clothes, the makeup. It isn't about that. So I feel, you know, how comfortable am I with it? As comfortable as I can be after, like, 25-plus years of it. She spent more than a decade pumping out hits like Sweet Dreams Are Made Of This, Would I Lie To You, and Sisters Are Doing It For Themselves with Dave Stewart as the Eurythmics. Then went on to strike gold with her first solo effort, Diva, in 1992. Diva went to number one in the UK and number 23 in the US and included the hit singles Why, Walking on Broken Glass and Little Bird. She released Medusa in 1995 before taking time off to raise her two daughters. To accompany her 2003 album Bear, she unveiled her first art exhibition at New York's Spike Gallery. It featured 30 nearly nude self-portraits of Annie. Perhaps they've seen other aspects of my presentation of myself as an artist in the visual sense. And I hope that they'll feel, in a, in a way, more connected with what I do if, with my music. And by the time she ventured into the studio again for songs of mass destruction, she'd become passionately involved in humanitarian work. The album's lead single, Sing, highlighted the reality of the HIV-AIDS situation in South Africa. I'm very much hoping that it will have some kind of impact because my commitment to the campaign is for the rest of my life and, um, and I hope that it will help to make a difference in other people's lives. Exactly 30 years since she and Dave Stewart formed The Tourists, she was feeling the need to do more with her music than entertain. There is something that I would like to get your attention about. And as a human being, um, uh, ethically and morally, and just as, uh, kind of like 
feeling that I'm proactive in the planet and I'm not just, you know, enjoying my own success, as it were, and reveling in that, but I'm engaging with other people in the world in a, in a particularly grassroots way, that really fulfills me. Astoundingly, 30 years after leaving the band he formed at school, Peter Gabriel is still asked whether there's any chance of a reunion with Genesis. Well, I wouldn't want to go back to the band, you know, and I usually say, you know, most people, do they want to go back living um, at home with their parents or go back to school? And the answer is probably no, but they, they're very happy maybe to, to visit and say hi to everybody. Uh, and if there was some, you know, big event um, or charitable thing or something, I, don't, I wouldn't rule it out, but do I want to rejoin the band? Um, no, you know, I have another life, um, which I'm enjoying a lot. Perhaps such a line of questioning would be understandable if he hadn't found success as a solo artist. But it's safe to say that Peter Gabriel remained at the forefront of innovation in British pop music throughout the 70s and 80s. The video to the lead single Sledgehammer from his So album in 1986 set a new standard for art in the music industry with its crazy stop-go animation and was recently voted the best video of all time. He was also a pioneer in promoting world music and is the driving force behind the WOMAD movement. His Real World Studios and record label was set up to provide a leg up and distribution to international acts and has dedicated himself to introducing artists like Yusu and Dor and Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan to Western culture. After all that, it's hard to believe he can still find the passion to write and perform himself. You know, after two weeks, I'm like a junkie looking for a piano. Uh, so I'm still an addict in that way. Uh, but I, for life, I'm interested in doing other things and, uh, you know, being able to follow different projects, having a bit of family time, friend time. Um, it's very easy. You get caught up in uh, the business and you get on a, on a roll um, and you find you go from one tour to another record, to a tour, to a record. Um, and you've seen a lot of hotels, airports, studios, and not much else. He does, however, also find the time to write the odd film soundtrack. His credits to date include Biko, The Last Temptation of Christ, and Rabbit Proof Fence. While his 2008 collaborations with Thomas Newman for the animated hit Wally won him a Grammy Award and a nomination for an Oscar. Like Annie Lennox, he has also become a devoted campaigner for human rights and recently formed the group Global Elders to work on solutions for seemingly insurmountable problems like climate change and poverty. Other members include Nelson Mandela, Kofi Annan and microcredit pioneer Muhammad Yunus. doctors and nurses, a whole host of other um, jobs out there that we could celebrate just as much. He was able to get away from it all to write and record his second album, All the Lost Souls. Uh, I went away to Ibiza, which is a Spanish island, and uh, it was just good to be away from the noise, really, the noise of everyday life and the, the noise of, you know, the media focus and, and, uh, and the job as a whole and uh, be again on my own and somewhere where you can just really uh, reflect and focus. Following big brother Daniel into the music business definitely gave Natasha Bedingfield a head start when it came to dealing with the rigours of the record industry. You know, he's always a phone call away and I just, um, anytime there's anything that comes up, I just call him and I'm like, hey, how do I deal with this? And 
I mean, that, that's, that's a great thing about being a younger sister. It happens your whole life. Not that she was riding on his coattails. After growing up singing in Christian pop groups, she landed her own record deal, and her first solo release single went straight to number three in the UK charts, paving the way for her debut album, Unwritten, which sold two and a half million copies across the world and earned her a Grammy nomination. She'd gone from being Daniel's little sis to being a star in her own right. You know, everyone has dreams, and um, I, I, you know, definitely dreamed and planned for things to happen, but it has happened very fast. In between Unwritten and her second album, NB, her thoughts on being happily single have matured into musings about relationships. That evolution was reflected in her writing on songs like I Wanna Have Your Babies and Soulmate. I want to talk about all the things that you kind of, as a girl, you keep in your head because you know that it's not... ...a million copies worldwide and went two times platinum in the US, with many of its songs featuring on American TV shows like Grey's Anatomy and The O.C. His ruffled lover looks, fondness for nightclubbing and high-profile romances with the likes of supermodel Petron M. Kova have also generated plenty of media interest in his private life. But James hasn't been phased by the British press's treatment of him. Um, not at all. We just have a tradition for giving each other a hard time in Britain. Um, and I'm sure it's character building. And he certainly hasn't let all the attention go to his head. Um, fame is definitely not, not a measure of success at all, and, and nor is money. Um, fame is a, a human construct, uh, and it's a, a little bit of an addiction of ours, which is not really relevant. We, if we talk about celebrity, we should perhaps focus on people who, who do uh, important jobs. Like... I love her in her bathroom. Really, Bedlam refers, as you may know, to a mental institute in London, and uh, the songs, really, for me, are a recollection of thoughts and ideas that normally uh, are, are quite private that you'd keep perhaps locked away in the cell of your own mind rather than sharing with, with people. And, and so for me this was a return to those memories and ideas from, uh, from my life experiences and recalling those and documenting them. It ended up being the third single off the album, You're Beautiful, that turned the former soldier into a worldwide sensation. And everyone wanted to know what the song was about. You're Beautiful is just one chapter in, in that um, and it was really about a moment where I saw my ex-girlfriend on the underground with uh, her new man, who I didn't know existed, but she and I caught eyes and lived a lifetime in that second, and I haven't seen her since. Back to Bedlam, sold 11... Of them want to change the world. Others just want to sing about love and heartache. Here come the singer-songwriters. James Blunt owes a little of his incredible success to actress and writer Carrie Fisher, whom he lodged with in LA while recording his debut album, Back to Bedlam. Apparently, the Star Wars star suggested the name of the album and let him record the song Goodbye My...